Uh, welcome back. Thank you very much for lasting for three hours. It's one thing for me to talk, but I know it's tiring to listen all the time. So I appreciate that everyone's here. So the third talk is about one of my other favorite things, and that's minerals, and specifically environmental minerals. So that may seem a strange term to you, but I'm going to explain what they are. And I'm going to sort of talk about mine waste a little bit, but take a bit of bigger tour of where environmental minerals can occur in bacteria and how they involved worms, fungi, and even our own bodies. So let's get an idea of environmental minerals for a change. So I'm going to tell you what the definition of environmental minerals is. Look at the way that bacteria and fungi are involved with minerals, and then worms, toxins or contaminants, and finally the human body, ourselves. OK, so what are these funny things called environmental minerals? So when I studied geology a long time ago, in the 1980s, there was one definition for minerals, and it was this. They're naturally occurring. They're inorganic. They're crystalline, like you see in the quartz. And they have a fixed or variable composition. So when I went to university, we studied minerals in rocks. So this lovely granite from the Shap district in the Lake District, beautiful uh, potassium feldspar crystals, quartz. We studied very nicely crystalline minerals in rocks. But things have changed, and we've moved on. And so we have a new type of mineral called an environmental mineral. So these are minerals. They're still naturally occurring, but they can also be derived by anthropogenic processes. So the way that we have impacted on the environment can generate minerals. They're still inorganic, but they're also organic. So we recognize that organic things like us and bacteria can be involved in the production of minerals, but also that minerals can take up organic compounds in their structures. They're not just inorganic. So now we're crossing the boundary into geomicrobiology, organic geochemistry, and so on. They're still crystalline in some times, but one of the other things is they can be very poorly crystalline to amorphous. <laughs> And that makes it challenging to study them. So we can use the techniques of our old type of mineralogy, like x-ray diffraction and microscopes. But we also need to use a large number of other techniques to characterize these minerals. And actually, that's what makes it fun, because we learn a lot more about different techniques. And then finally, they also have a fixed or variable composition. So we're broadening the definition of minerals now to include minerals that occur in the natural world on the Earth's surface, largely. So things that are involved with organics and are poorly crystalline. So here's some examples of environmental minerals, which are still minerals. It's a subset. If I start up here, this is minerals. Um, I work with a geomicrobiologist, and we were doing some experiments on how bacteria leach minerals. And so you've got the mineral here, but you've got this sort of spider web stuff. And that's EPS, extra polymeric crystalline substance, I think. It's secreted by the bacteria. So the bacteria join themselves by this material, and they gain nutrients from it. These are some environmental minerals in Cyprus. These are what we call soluble sulfates. So this is from acid mine drainage. You have a lot of sulfate, and you have cations like iron and copper and so on. When that water evaporates, you get these things. They look like cauliflower or crusts. And you wouldn't think they're minerals, but they're actually minerals. So you've got some blue stuff here. This is an iron sulfate some yellow, a different type of iron sulfate. These are pretty hard to characterize. You can x-ray diffract them, but they change with humidity. So it's really, you have to do it really carefully. So we use different techniques to study that. This is a photo from my PhD. So this is a grain of uh, sediment grain in the River Tyne in the northeast England. And I'm using backscattered scanning electron microscopy, so it highlights this element is very heavy, so it's actually full of lead. And the rest of it's iron and manganese. So this is a mineral that grew in the floodplain. And as it did, it incorporated lead into its structure. So you can see it's all zoned. There's some lead here, but no lead here. And again, this mineral was pretty. You couldn't see it on an XRD. I had to use microscopy and other techniques to look at it. And then actually, this is a banded iron, excuse me, banded iron formation from the Proterozoic. So even then, environmental minerals were forming. These reddish bands are iron oxides, and they form as very poorly crystalline minerals first, and then they crystallize. So environmental minerals are everywhere. 
Here's the definition that was created by the International Mineralogical Association in recognition of environmental minerals. So they've included geochemistry in this. Environmental mineralogy and geochemistry is an interdisciplinary field. We all need to work with these other groups. Dealing with systems at or near the surface of the Earth, where the geosphere comes in contact with the hydrosphere, atmosphere, and biosphere. And by biosphere, that includes us. So our impacts on the Earth's surface as well. So it's recognized that this is a field of mineralogy. And this is a wheel my colleagues and I have constructed to show that environmental minerals can occur in all these different sort of sciences, but to understand them properly, it's nice to work with people from these different um, disciplines. So if we're understanding minerals in the human body, work with toxicologists. If we're working on minerals in engineered systems, engineers and so on. So it, it makes it challenging because you really have to, you can't sort of just work in your field to really understand these things, but it makes it really rewarding at the same time that you start to get a bigger picture understanding of how minerals are so important in our Earth system. So that's what's been fun over the years. <clears throat> okay, so I'm just going to give you some examples. Some of them are mine, and some of them are from other people's work, because I don't work in all these fields. So let's think about bacteria, fungi, and minerals. So my geomicrobiology, again, is a discipline that's probably been around for 20 years, I think. So this is microbiologists that are geologists as well or work on geologic systems. And for a long time, we've recognized that bacteria, first of all, they're everywhere, absolutely everywhere on our Earth's surface. They're down deep in the Marianas Trench in the Pacific. They're in our stomachs. They're everywhere. And as a result, minerals, formation, and dissolution is influenced by bacteria and other microorganisms. So there's bacteria, archaea, fungi. And so I'm just going to give you a few examples of that. So we know that they're intimately involved. So here's a couple of examples of formation of minerals that are, is aided by bacteria. So bacteria can help form minerals in a number of different ways. One of the ways is that they actually participate in redox reactions. So it all goes back to your original <laughs> chemistry that you learned at university. So redox reactions are very important for bacteria and other microorganisms to gain energy. So in this case, we've got some manganese um, minerals here, these manganese sort of blades or spider webs, I suppose. And these were formed by the activity of bacteria that oxidize manganese. So they oxidize the manganese from manganese 2 plus in solution, probably to manganese 4 plus in these minerals. The reason they do that is to gain energy. So they, they eat organic matter so they can do the um, oxidation. The energy they gain from the oxidation they use to grow and to reproduce. So they can cause redox reactions to happen, and they do in, in a lot of environmental systems. So these are examples of oxidation reactions. So here you've got the manganese oxides produced. These are bioreactor experiments in the lab, but it happens in nature too. And these these colleagues were good enough to get uh, pictures of the cells left over. So really good examples of how that, that happened. Now in this case, you can see that the minerals are actually on the outsides of the cell walls. So the, the bacteria have helped to make the manganese change, but actually the manganese mineral production itself probably is inorganic. The bacteria have been involved, but the minerals have formed separately. But it's, it's still an interrelated process. Now here's some older rocks, um, 350 million years old. And again, we've got hematite microfossils. So these, these blades, um, these sort of stringers, I mean. These are minerals of hematite. And again, we've probably had a situation where we have iron oxidizing bacteria, oxidizing the iron 2 plus to iron 3 plus that's then taken up in hematite. And we've got this sort of remnant, this might be an EPS, or remnant sort of trails of the bacteria left around. So to give you another example of oxidizing bacteria, I'm going to tell you about a study I was involved in. I'm taking you up to the north of Canada now. So this is Yellowknife. <clears throat> um, the rest of Canada is down here. Most of us live down here because it's too cold up here. But this is the Canadian Shield, and there's lots of mineral deposits on the Canadian Shield. And Yellowknife was born from a gold deposit. So it's the area, the part where, well, polar bears don't actually get that far south, but they use polar bears for this area because there's some polar bears up here. 
So it's a fantastic northern town. So in 1935, the, this gold was discovered, so fairly late on, and this giant mine was born, and actually the, the town of Yellowknife was born. There were indigenous peoples living there, but the town of Yellowknife was born. And so the mining uh, produced from 1948 to 2004 and produced a lot of gold and brought prosperity to the north of Canada. It was pretty uninhabited at the time, and now Yellowknife is a seat of government for the Northwest Territories. So you can see the terrain, it's lots of granites, lots of lakes, um, pine, very little vegetation, just really short vegetation. It's typical North Canada, very beautiful. And so this mine is sitting here, but it doesn't operate anymore. So the gold at Giant Mine was contained in arsenopyrite, like much gold around the world. Um, they roasted the arsenopyrite, so they burned it to get the gold out. And this is the reaction. So they take the two moles of the arsenic pyrite in oxygen, burning it. The products of the reaction were hematite, so that's a lot of the waste. Sulfur dioxide, which was a problem at the time for acid rain. And this one, arsenic 2O3. The arsenic at that form is arsenic trioxide, <clears throat> which is the more toxic form of arsenic. Um, so at the moment, this site in Yellowknife is one of the highest concentrations of arsenic trioxide anywhere on Earth, one of them. At the moment, they store the arsenic in big containers, the, sorry, the arsenic trioxide in big containers underground. And ever since 2004, they've been looking at what they should do about it. So they've started a big project called the Giant Mine Remediation Project, and it's been going since 2004, trying to figure out what to do about these containers. And the wider area, unfortunately, probably like Idria, is contaminated with arsenic because of the smelter. So there is an arsenic problem up here. Fortunately, though, they've done health studies and it doesn't seem to be affecting people. So that's good. So they, they've been looking at options for what to do with this arsenic trioxide. And they've considered, they've, uh, they've done a really good job. They, they have lots of community consultation, lots of meetings. The government is putting a lot of money into this issue. So I was involved um, laterally with a project um, that involved a geologist friend of mine in Canada who works in this area and a microbiologist. So the geologist, Heather her name is, had been underground and noticed that there were these sort of funny slimes on the wall. They're, they're very wet and you know, slimy and colored and she didn't know what they were. So in talking to my, my friend Joanne, who's a microbiologist, Joanne recognized these are biofilms. They're actually live. So they're full of bacteria, yeast, fungi, all sorts of things. They live underground in these arsenic, hugely arsenic-rich environments. So Joanne had a student who studied the bacteria, some of the bacteria that were in this, this slime. <clears throat> and Tom, the student, was able to isolate this bacterium here that you can see and called it, you can call bacteria what you like. So they called it GM1 Giant Mine 1. So this at the time, this was 2010, um, Joanne herself had worked on bacteria that oxidize arsenic-3 plus to arsenic-5 plus. So she knew a lot about it. But this was the first time a bacterium had been isolated that could do it at such low temperatures. So you're in the north of Canada. Before climate change, it was all permafrost. It's changing now. But it was very cold. So this bacterium is an arsenite oxidizer, oxidizing at very low temperatures. Very difficult. So that was pretty exciting, for one thing, but also there's a mineral side of this as well. So we know that GM1 can convert to arsenic 5 plus. That arsenic 5 plus was then taken up in this mineral, this sort of rusty mineral here. And this is called euconite. So it's calcium iron arsenate, so it's arsenic 5 plus, with some water in the structure. And so really, this is an example of natural bioremediation. The bacteria oxidize the toxic arsenite to arsenate, that's then taken up in a mineral and stored, as long as the conditions in this area don't change. So that was, that was pretty exciting. No one had really looked at the bacteria in this area before. And so it was proposed as one of the ways that we could be used for bioremediation in the area. So the com committee that looking at the remediation considered this quite carefully, and they've considered a lot of things. And unfortunately, they didn't think of it as being a big scale a possibility, not at the moment anyway. What they're actually going to do for now, and it, it could change in the future, is try and freeze, which sounds crazy in the Canadian North, 
because it's usually frozen, but the permafrost is melting. So they're putting down tubes to freeze the arsenic trioxide in place. They, if they don't want to move it, because that could cause all sorts of problems, keep it underground and freeze it until they have a better system. So someday, this might work, if they can get it to an industrial scale. And it, does, it is happening underground anyway, so it is naturally helping the arsenic situation. But here we go, bacteria and minerals and fluids all inter, intergrown. So we know that bacteria and fungi also play roles in mineral dissolution, not only mineral formation, but mineral dissolution. So this is a picture on the cover of Science a few years ago, and it shows hematite, so Fe2O3. And these are bacteria that will reduce the iron. So they take it from iron 3 plus to iron 2 plus by dissolving the mineral. It's called geobacter. So not only bacteria, algae, fungi, lichens as well, they can all cause mineral dissolution. So if you're thinking about building anything, you really want to know about this a bit. They can do it directly. So in this case, you can see the bacteria have attached to the surface. And what they're doing is trying to get what they want out of the mineral. So in this case, Geobacter wants to uh, reduce the iron. So it's going for the iron in the mineral. It's changing it from 3 plus to 2 plus. Other bacteria, I've seen a bacteria on a feldspar and will only take out the potassium. It leaves everything else. So it only takes what it wants. They're really clever. It can also do it indirectly. So they don't attach, but they recognize there's something in the mineral they want. And so they can change the chemistry of around the fluids around the mineral, and that will cause dissolution. So here's a couple of examples, some from my work. So I've been working a little bit on calcopyrite dissolution. Um, and you can see we had some experiments going with Joanne again, my colleague. And the bacteria consortium, in this case, were making these pits in the calcopyrite. And they were actually along the atomic planes in the calcopyrite. So they're, they're not stupid, these bacteria. They don't want to work too hard. So they're going to go for the easiest option. And the plane between atoms is the easiest way to get into a mineral. So that's why you can see these lovely parallel dissolution pits. Here's another study in Australia where they've done bioleaching bacteria as well. And they're, ha they're being able to dissolve the calcopyrite. But you can see they've left this EPS behind while they do so. So bioleaching, which I know you all know about, takes advantage of using bacteria to dissolve minerals. And there's a lot of work going on to find new bacteria that do this, and the best group, often it's a group of bacteria that do it better than other bacteria. So the fungi, there's a guy called Jeff Gadd who works up in Dundee in Scotland. He's, he's sort of been leading work on fungi and minerals. And again, fungi are also able to dissolve minerals. So this is a set of work he did um, on depleted uranium when that was quite uh, in, fo in vogue, I suppose. So it's an experiment. He's got some bacteria here. He's got a piece of depleted uranium here. And he's seeing how the fungi dissolve the depleted uranium and actually then what happens. So here, these are the stages from A to B. You've got the, min um, sorry, the bacteria, the fungi rather, here and the DU here. And the fungi start to put hyphae down on the surface of the depleted uranium. Here's an enlargement of that. And you can see the fungi now going into the depleted uranium. But in this case, not only did they dissolve the depleted uranium, they also caused precipitation of these minerals. So you can see they're lovely platelets. They're hexagonal platelets, actually. And they're formed of uranium phosphate. That's a really good thing, because uranium phosphate is incredibly insoluble. It's one of the, phosphates are one of the most insoluble types of minerals there are. So by these fungi making these minerals, that's locking away the uranium in a stable form. So although it's breaking it down, it's actually causing a type of remediation. And that's because the fungi likely are going for the uranium to change the oxidation state of the uranium. So Jeff's also been involved in lots of work about fungi. And building stone preservation in all of Europe, I'm sure you know, is very important. We don't want our buildings to degrade like this. And a lot of the degradation, is part of it's caused by acid rain, of course. But a lot of it's caused by the activities of microorganisms. So again, we know that fungi can attach themselves to minerals um, by grain-to-grain -grain bridging. Um, they use their hyphae to extend into the minerals. And then they will react with the minerals and secrete a secondary product, like this biomineral cement. Now, in some cases, that might be a good thing, because maybe the cement is very stable and it preserves the building. But in other cases, the cement is maybe very soluble. 
So once that cement is formed and it rains, maybe that then dissolves, starts to dissolve the building away. So it's working with these micro, uh, fungi people and also, again, understanding the minerals and the geochemical processes going on. Okay, so let's go on, we can use that, to worms. So why worms? Well, I have a very good friend called Mark Hodson, who's at, now at the University of York. And Mark's done a lot of things, and he got into worms for a while. Um, and we know that worms are everywhere. They're really important for soil um, and agriculture. But actually, we know that worms, like all organisms, secrete, um, well, manure or worm castings. So here's some worm castings. You can see there's mineral material in there, and there's actually a lot of organic material as well, and plants and so on. And we know that the worms go through the soil profile and then they secrete these basically on the surface. So Mark's done a lot of work on worms. He's looked at worms in mine waste to see if they're tolerant to contaminants, but he's also looked at CO2 and carbon. So they, the work that they've done at the, well, he was at the University of Reading when he did this. He's now at the University of York. But he realized that one of the things that's secreted in the worm cast are these, these granules. And they're actually calcite. They're, well, they're calcium carbonate. So we know calcium carbonate is CaCO3. So it's got carbon in the structure. So these worms are sequestering carbon in the calcium carbonate. So we had a big project looking at whether worms could be a real sink or effective sink of calcium carbonate in soils and carbon. So he did some experiments, and he found that the worms produce quite a lot of um, grams of calcite per, per meter squared per year, so that's good. Um, therefore, sequestering a lot of 98 kilograms of carbon per hectare, so that's also good. And a nice sequestration number there as well. The number I haven't put up here and here is they also did dissolution experiments, so we know they produce these, but they do dissolve as well. And the rate of dissolution is almost the same as the rate of production, unfortunately. So they do are temporary stores of carbon, but they are intimately involved in carbon cycling. And it was quite interesting at the time. Again, thinking of a little organism like a worm could sequester carbon like this, quite fascinating. But the other fascinating thing was, if you're really into minerals, it's the mineral forms of these are really fantastic structures. So you've got a sort of core that they grow around and then these sort of blades of calcium carbonate, which is really odd. Um, so the other thing is they, they have been able to use the calcium carbonate for dating because there's a little bit of uranium in here, so they've been able to do that. And they were able to say something about these biominerals. So they're environmental minerals produced by worms, or some people call them biominerals. And it, it sort of tells you a lot about crystallization of minerals, which is important as well. So basically, the, they sort of start from the center, and then they, they build outwards like this, but they're always bladed out from the center. So you can see the blades coming out this way. So they precipitate an amorphous form first, and then that recrystallizes over time. And that's very typical of most minerals. And the, the problem with this dissolution of the carbonate is because as they grow, they take up other trace elements. So that destabilizes the mineral, um, and you've got these zones, and that's why they can dissolve so easily. So the worms are really great at taking up everything and temporarily storing this carbon, which is fantastic. No, I wouldn't really have thought of worms as making minerals but they really do. OK, so let's think about toxins. This is a bit of a longer section. So we know minerals can incorporate toxins or contaminants. We know there's a lot of toxins on the Earth's surface. So we've got black smokers in the sea. Um, these, in our minds, might produce toxins. There's um, arsenic and copper. But actually, the bacteria make use of that down there. I know you're working a lot on urban geochemistry here. We know there's lots of toxins in our urban environments. There's mine waste environments. There's natural toxins like volcanic particles. And here's another mining example. This is a town in northwest, uh, yeah, northeast Australia. Lovely wedding day for a couple. And the smoke sort of luckily is blowing the smoke away. So they're very happy. <laughs> now, mine waste, you know, I work on, and I know a lot of you work on, and I, we were talking about, you used this word earlier today. They're natural laboratories. And they're fantastic in about laboratories because you've got all these different minerals and they're interacting with bacteria and contaminants. So a lot of the understanding, and the, actually the birth of environmental mineralogy, I think really started with mine waste minerals. So here's some examples again. These are these soluble sulfate minerals. Here's actually a reaction zone in a, some waste in Cyprus where you've actually got the pyrite reacting right there to form secondary minerals. 
This is a mineral in Cornwall called Batalicite. So it's named after the Batalic mine. Cornwall is a fantastic place for many things, including minerals. And it's a secondary mineral produced by the wettering of copper ore. And this one you've seen, this is my thesis mineral, my lead-bearing iron manganese oxides. So all of these minerals tell us a lot about processes going on with environmental minerals. So you've also seen this slide. Again, we know that mine wastes contain all of these minerals. And we can study these minerals and the reactions between them and the fluids to work out what's going on in our mine wastes. The categories are these. So we, the more we know about all these minerals, I think the better off we are to be able to interpret our geochemical data. Here are our sulfides, our various ores that we tend to be the starting point if we're dealing with sulfide ores. Here are the non-sulfides, so the carbonates and the silicates. So understanding these minerals helps us understand the reactions as well. In terms of a real environmental mineral, here's an example of these compounds. So actually, these are environmental minerals. So when we roast our ores, we actually produce new minerals. This is from Yellowknife. Here we've got maghemite and hematite. These are high temp well, the maghemite is a high temperature form of iron oxide. So it's produced by roasting. That's a new mineral. It wasn't there in the first place. Cyanide compounds are also environmentally produced. And then when we're studying these pathways, we want to know what they weather into. So there's a whole range of secondary minerals, iron, aluminium, calcium, and so on, that we can try and characterize. So these mine wastes are really good places to start, and not the only environment. But. So to study these, I said you need lots of techniques. And these are the techniques my groups and I have used over the years. So we use traditional techniques like XRD, we use scanning electron microscope microscopy, I know you have here. We can map the distribution of elements using X-ray mapping. We can do geochemical chemical extractions to work out whether something is residual or extractable. We can work with chemists and simulate mineral structures in a computer and put contaminants in and see how that affects the mineral. X-ray absorption spectroscopy at a synchrotron, looking at the atomic level. We can model with things like Freaksy and, and so on. So these are just some of the techniques we can use. So just to give you a flavor of some of the things that, that we do with mine waste, oh, sorry. Um, ultimately, we're trying to understand these reactions. So what are the mine tailings doing in the environment with the fluids? We have primary minerals. They're going to fluids, and they're going to secondary minerals. We want to know how. What is the mechanism? What is the reason? And it's difficult because there's all sorts of factors that can affect these things. pH, e, the redox, bacteria, the solution, whether the mineral can absorb things, and whether evaporation is taking place. So it's complicated, but it makes it really fun. It's like a puzzle. It's like being Sherlock Holmes all the time. So some of the questions we ask ourselves is, first of all, we start with characterization. We want to know what the minerals are. And that's often the hardest thing. Trying to figure out when these minerals are so poorly crystalline, what are they? And where do the contaminants live in the mineral? So one mineral group I've particularly worked on is the Jarosite mineral family. Um, I'm not really sure why I picked jarosite. I think because it's yellow and it's kind of cheerful and it, it's such an interesting mineral. So here's the general formula, A, B3, TO4. And in the A, the B, and the T site, we can put all sorts of different elements. And some of them are contaminants. So in the A site, we can put lead. In the B site, we can put aluminum, copper. In the T site, we can put arsenic. And in mine waste sites, jarosite is a really important mineral at low pH for storing a lot of these elements. So we've done a lot of work over the years on jarosite minerals. Um, I'll show you some of that. This is a computer simulation we did of jarosites, putting copper ions in, seeing whether that was stable. And then, boom, in 2004, there was a boost to jarosite research because they found it on Mars. So suddenly, everybody was really interested in jarosite. So all the work we've done helps understanding on Mars, too. Not, not just mine, but other people. So these are some of the things we've done to understand mineral cycling in these systems. So this is the asthma KR spill again. And we looked at the morphology, but we also looked at some of the reactions going on. So after floods, or after rains rather, this is after all the vegetation's been stripped, we had pools forming on the floodplain like this. And they're actually really acid. They're like pH 2, and they contain up to 55,000 micrograms per liter arsenic. So there's still reactions going on getting arsenic into systems. So we studied these minerals and the fluids to try and understand why. 
We went to the synchrotron. This is Zane's profiles. Uh, we did some electron mapping and some other techniques as well. And basically what we found was there were still little tiny pockets of tailings on the floodplain, just tiny ones like that. And they were enough to cause reaction to generate secondary iron oxides, which fortunately took up the arsenic. But the fact was there were still some tailings. So actually the company went out and did one more phase of cleanup and got that stuff up too. So that's just a nice reaction you can work out using some of these techniques. Other things that we've done is lab experiments. So this is a postdoc of mine, Patachero from Spain, um, who worked on aluminium sulfates in mine waste. So if the pH is a little higher, about pH 4, the aluminium starts to precipitate as this white sort of stuff. And we were interested in how that dissolved. So Pat spent two years with lots of beakers dissolving alunite, okay, which is, um, I've got the formula, it's another mineral containing aluminium, and was able to work out dissolution rates of alunite, and then to figure out how the alunite dissolved. So this is a simulation, and you can see um, that's the potassium there, and that's the hydroxide. And what happens is the mineral surfaces where the potassium is at the surface dissolve first and then it causes the rest of the mineral just to dissolve. So you can work that out at the atomic level. And then Adrian worked on gerasites. So gerasite we know is stable at low pH. But most systems for remediation, and at the time they were thinking about remediating the, the Rio Tinto. And so you use lime. And we thought, well, there's a lot of gerasite in the Rio Tinto. If you remediate, what's going to happen to it? It's all going to dissolve. What's going to happen to the contaminants? So Adrian also worked in the lab. He loved, oops, he loved making gerasites. So he made lots of gerasites, and then he dissolved them, both in acid water and in lime water, so high pH. So here are some of his results. He made a lead arsenic gerasite. Here's before, and here's after. You can see it's all been eaten up with acid dissolution. And he was able to work out, and you can see there's a frosting on the surface. So he was able to work out the reaction that that Gerasite dissolved in acid, generated a secondary mineral, which locked the lead away. So that was great. The lead didn't go anywhere, but the arsenic did. So the arsenic was released. He also did the same thing in alkali. So this, is, this would be if you remediated with lime. Again, you can see the before and the after. And again, there's a frosting on top. And the reaction is generating that lead again, lead sulfate, so locking the lead away, generating arsenic, but luckily, that arsenic then gets taken up by that iron hydroxide. So actually, remediating with lime, it will break down the gerasite, but it will lock everything away in new minerals. So that's a good thing. And we've been able to, or Adrian was able to work that out. So he came up with a lot of different uh, experiments. And basically, the gerasite would dissolve, but it would turn into something else. So luckily, things were locked, still locked away. So another thing that we do in our mine waste mineralogy is looked at, can we use minerals to remediate mine wastes? So this is some work with antimony and arsenic. And this is a plot from New Zealand. And here we've got arsenic on the x-axis versus antimony on the y, and it's log scale. But you can see there is a correlation. So the arsenic and antimony occur together. They're related. We knew there was a mineral called scoridite that had arsenic in it, we know it's quite stable. We thought, can we put antimony into that mineral and see if it makes a stable mineral to lock the antimony away? So I had a postdoc doing some experiments where he made scoridite and then put increasing amounts of antimony in as we go down. But what happened is the antimony didn't go into scoridite. And that's actually because it's too big. You should have realized that, but it's too big. It's really big compared to the arsenic. What it did is it made its own mineral called tripuiite, which is a great name, FeSbO4. But the great thing about tripuiite is that it's really insoluble. David, the postdoc, tried to dissolve it in hydrofluoric acid, and it would not dissolve. So in the environment, tripuiite might be a way to store antimony away and remediate antimony sites. So that, that's something we're hoping to pursue someday. We also, can we use the natural ability of bacteria to remediate wine wastes? So this is bioleaching, and what we want to do is turn it on its head to use the bacteria to remediate. So this is Cyprus. This is Joanne, my friend. She was isolating some of the bacteria in this bioleaching experiment where they produce very nice copper and seeing what the bacteria are. 
if we can maybe not make use of these bacteria, because they're the ones dissolving the waste, but if we can make use of other bacteria to maybe stop the, this, this process and remediate mine waste, that would be good. You've already seen the yellow knife example, and maybe someday that bacteria could be used to remediate yellow knife. I hope so. So there's lots of mine waste stuff to do, and that's not the only contaminated environment. There's other types of contaminants as well, and minerals are involved in all of them. And then finally, the human body, us. So, um, well, this is something we don't want, but if you if I happen to produce kidney stones, these are biominerals or environmental minerals as well. Um, kidney stones, like you see here, are mixtures of organic materials, but they also contain minerals. So they can be calcium carbonate, but often they're calcium oxalates. So they actually have carbon in them. That's an environmental mineral. Okay, there's two different types here, wellwellite and wedolite. So they're, they're hydrated calcium carbon minerals. And they make beautiful minerals, really beautiful minerals when you look at them under an SEM. Um, now, these are stabilized um, by all the things in our bodies, bacteria, um, viruses, and some chemistry of our water. That stabilizes these minerals. That's actually what we don't want. We really don't want these things. But this is what's going on, and by studying the form of these kidney stones, hopefully doctors can understand how they form and maybe how to treat them as well. Our teeth are environmental minerals. So here's our teeth. There's a pulp in the mineral. That's not a mineral, but the, in the middle, sorry. The pulp is not a mineral. The dendrite and enamel are both minerals, and they're actually calcium phosphates. So appetite. We know there's appetite in rocks, but there's appetite in our bodies as well. So hydroxyapatite, so it's got an OH in it. So the enamel is thin and it's really, really hard. So we, we use that to grind our food. The dentine is more porous and more organic rich. So it actually contains a lot of organic material. So it's a really an organic hydroxyapatite that we've got. And here's some pictures of those. You can see the dendrite, which is sort of more porous. You can see the hydroxyapatite is very porous in this case. And there'd probably be organic material in between there. Whereas the enamel is, is bigger crystals that are hexagonal, and that's what gives it its strength. So again, if you're trying to think about tooth decay and how these hydroxyapatites form, that's you, when you can start to think about how to protect your enamel. And that's actually why sometimes they put fluoride in water, and the fluoride would go into this place and stabilize the hydroxyapatite. So that's why fluoride is added to water. And then, of course, our bones are also hydroxyapatite. So all of our bones, this is sort of hexagonal hydroxyapatite as well. Everything bone-like in our body is hydroxyapatite. And that's why if you're getting older, you're encouraged to drink and eat a lot of calcium to keep your bones strong, because the calcium will go in into that mineral structure. So it's a calcium phosphate. Here's what bones look like. Um, this is a blow up of the hexagonal plates and you've got um, organic material sort of connecting the bones, but this is also hydroxyapatite. Uh, sorry, so you've got organics and the bone material. So our environmental minerals in our body are biominerals. They're not exactly like rock minerals, but it's basically the same mineral. So hopefully that gives you an idea of what environmental minerals are. This growing field, and I think we're all contributing to it. You certainly are doing a lot of work on your SEM. Um, these new minerals that take into account environmental processes. We know that bacteria and fungi are involved. We know that worms can make cal or calcium carbonate and sequester CO2. We know they're important for toxins, taking in toxins and releasing toxins. And finally, we are biomineral, partly, and blood and all those other things. Okay, any questions?